Hi, Monique. Thanks for joining us. Uh, it's Tim here with Monique Gary from Louisiana for Health Freedom. And first thing I want to ask is, how did you get involved with LouisianaForHealthFreedom.org? Well, first of all, um, uh, it's very close, but it's Louisiana for Medical Freedom. There we go. Yep, sorry. Yes, yes. It, well, because we have a Louisiana Health Freedom mm -hmm. here in, in Louisiana, so that there are two groups, it's easy to confuse the two. Um, but no, my involvement with uh, Louisiana for Medical Freedom really, it just, just kind of happened. It, it became Louisiana for Medical Freedom um, uh, probably latter part of August and ju just trying to do something uh, proactive, something constru constructive with everything that was going on around us. Um, I started meeting with some like-minded healthcare providers and um, some attorneys got involved and we started talking about legal action. And before I knew it, I needed to name it something because it was becoming a not-for-profit. And um, I started a telegram channel and I needed to name it. And then the moment I just called it Louisiana for medical freedom, because at the time I had people from all over the state reaching out. I didn't intend for it to be Louisiana for medical freedom, but I felt like if I just said, this area we call Acadiana. Acadiana for medical freedom was probably my first thought, mm -hmm. um, but it didn't feel representative. So people from all around the state were reaching out to you. What were they? What were they looking for, and why were they reaching out to you? Um, they were reaching out for support, for help. Uh, they were feeling the squeeze of, uh, you know, having to take the. COVID vaccine and um, kind of confused as to um, what their rights were, um, you know, what the definition of a mandate is. is. Is that a law? Do I have to do it? You know, can my employer really require this? Um, all the questions that come with territory that we've never been in before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So people were reaching out to you and I understand that you were like teaching at, um, Louisiana Lafayette, is that right? You're right, the local university. Mm -hmm. And um, then kind of what triggered you or spurred you to kind of take this effort on? Well, I, I guess the only way I can answer that question is just to speak a little, um, give you a, a brief history of my background. Uh, I'm a 36 year, I'm a 37 almost now nurse. Um, registered nurse and majority of my clinical ex experience has been in critical care, a little over 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, I dabbled in other departments within the hospital, like the cath lab and the outpatient department and uh, things like recovery room. So I, I had a, you know, a, a pretty wide perspective of um, just being a clinical floor nurse and, and a unit nurse. Um, and then I had eight years that I spent in a administrative position uh, at a cardiovascular hospital. So I really uh, gained a lot of insight into what it takes to run a hospital, the, the amount of regulations that are involved, the amount of um, local politics and regional politics, if you want to put it that way, all the pressures involved with making decisions. We, we'd like to think it's really just about patient care, but that's just one factor in the mix. Um, the common theme in hospitals has been, you know, it's a business. And I, I can honestly say when I started nursing, um, that did not feel so prevalent as it does today. The, the, the concept that we're running a business, um, it felt more about patient care. Mm -hmm. so it's just kind of the direction it's gone in. I mean, it's always been a business. It's, just not had the amount of um, emphasis, the amount of regulation, uh, exterior and interior pressures. And then from there, uh, when I left the hospital setting, I really was kind of burnt out with hospitals and disillusioned, to be honest with you. Um, I needed something totally different. So I went to the university because I wanted to um, form future nurses and future nurse leaders. That was my vision. So I spent five years at the university. So my perspective comes from my life experience. It's no one thing. It's an accumulation of all of it. 
And um, this past summer, I could uh, see where things were headed in a direction I <laughs> was very uncomfortable with and a lot of people were uncomfortable with. And um, I struggled the previous semester being in the hospital setting and, and being a part of the process. <laughs> um, I say the process because of everything that was going on with everything surrounding the pandemic, uh, you know, just n- not just the vaccines or the shot, but the, the, the isolation, um, people dying in the hospital without their loved ones there, um, the masking after a while. I mean, it, it all just became very um, smothering, suffocating. It, it did not feel normal at all. Um, and so I felt when the local hospitals kind of made the announcement that they were going to mandate, um, I'll call it the shot because I don't don't really consider it a vaccine per se, but the COVID shot, um, I knew that I couldn't go back because if I had to take it, I wasn't going to, and I didn't want to quit in the middle of semester because that would be worse than quitting right before the semester began. So um, I resigned and, you know, I, just, I resigned for a lot of reasons, but the biggest reason was ethically. I, I couldn't, I couldn't remain um, a part of the medical tyranny. I felt complicit. If I could not, you know, speak freely about how I felt about things, I, I would have trouble sleeping at night. And I just, I just was struggling. So I, I promised myself that if if I resigned from my job, I wasn't going to go find another job and try to, you know, fit in somewhere. I figured, well, I need to be a part of the solution. I didn't know what that looked like. I had no clue. Um, I just prayed about it. And I started reaching out to a couple of like-minded healthcare workers, a a physician in particular. And uh, from that, this this grew and snowballed into a pretty big movement. (laughs) I call it a movement because it's it's not just legal action. It's it's kind of hard to define. Yeah. No, it is. It has become a movement. And I just like kind of struck by maybe the, some of the heartbreaking scenes that you saw at the hospital and with people not being able to be with their loved ones. And then the the rules and the, the unethical nature of some of the mandates and, and, you know, then you kind of made a really difficult decision, it seems like to leave the system and that you'd been involved in for 37, 38 years. And come out and take a new path. It, it sounds like that was a real. It must have been a real difficult decision. Extremely. Um, it was a leap of faith. There's no other way to define that because I didn't know. I've, I've never not had a job. Um, <laughs> I mean, most people haven't had a job, but my temperament, my personality, my firstborn. You're supposed to be responsible. You know, um, probably defined as an overachiever. Um, you know, this is radical for me, but at the same time, I've never been more true to who I am and authentic. So it's really not radical. As long as you're being yourself, you're not being radical. You're just being true to yourself. And I just knew that I was being called to something different and that I needed to make a decision, not based on fear. If I were fearful, I probably would have stayed in my job because I'd have been fearful of not having a paycheck or fearful of being ostracized or fearful of being labeled a failure. But um, I, and none of that, I don't know, say it didn't come into play. That didn't stop me from wanting to, I think, participate in something far more important than, you know, the things I just mentioned the security of a job. Yeah. Well, well, I'm sure it took a lot of courage. And then when you're coming from your true self and something that you feel is real and, and right, it must be energizing and at the same time, frightening to step out of that, but then to step (laughs) into this movement. Yeah. Yeah, certainly. Certainly. So what happened when, when you stepped out, like what were the first things that you started to do? Um, well, like I said, I reached out to, uh, uh, a fellow physician that I really hadn't spoken to in 10 years and w- we were more acquaintances, 
Um, I just knew we were probably like minded. And when I reached out to him, I didn't know if he would even respond. Um, but he responded like within an hour of me messaging him. And um, we spoke that night for an hour. And it was kind of like I was talking to a male soulmate. He was struggling with everything I was struggling with. And at the end of the conversation, our comments to each other was, uh, you know, I didn't want to be the one to have to do this, but no one else is doing it. So I guess I'm going to have to. And, you know, we were both like, yes, (laughs) like, why does it have to be me? But no one else is stepping up and saying, whoa, time out. Hello. Um, You know, half of the healthcare workers are not on board with this. At the time, really, it was more than half. Um, It's just people were afraid to say how they really felt about things. Mm -hmm. Because at that point, there was a lot of pressure and um, intimidation, you know, uh, uh, bullying. um, And everyone's job, they felt like no one wants to lose their job. They didn't want to put that at risk. So it it was really hard to know exactly how many people were like-minded. Um, and of course there were those that certainly don't feel the way we feel. And, and there still is that to today. Um, but once I reached out to him, he, he I, I commented, I said, you know, I'm not sure what we need to do, but it feels like we need legal representation. And he says, I've had the same thought. I reached out to a friend of mine who um, feels similar and uh He's having conversation with his partners. He was part of a prominent law firm. And unfortunately, even though they were aligned in how he felt, um, they didn't want to take on the political pressure of making a stand, such as, you know, addressing medical freedom. And so um, he ultimately left that practice in order to to represent and and help help us in the fight. And so we kind of became the triangle of of. uh, of the movement, I guess. And um, after that first conversation, uh, Ed decided he was going to try to meet with um, s- some uh, physicians. And and I said, well, I'm going to see how many nurses I can network with just to see what the need is and, and what they need and what we can do. And, uh, you know, I've, I've worked at the large hospitals here in Lafayette. So I put the word out that I was going to have a Zoom meeting. and. Um, Within a week, um, he had 40 physicians show up for a meeting at his house, and I had over 100 nurses um, log into a Zoom meeting. If, I, if I'd have had capacity for 500, I probably would have had a couple of hundred, but I, I tapped out at 100 yeah. in the basic package. And uh, that was the beginning of organizing. You know, From there, we had another meeting a week later uh, that had um, a variety of, of participants. Um, you know, nurses, doctors, um, nurse practitioners, PAs, concerned citizens, attorneys. And um, quickly within the next week, um, we had a team assembled of four attorneys and um, a list of plaintiffs that were interested in joining a lawsuit against the two major hospital systems here in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. So it, it happened very fast. It snowballed. And, um, you know, I learned the lesson that Zoom was limited and I really, at the time I was on Telegram, I know it's uncensored social media and I realized it was free and I could have 25,000 members. And so I developed a channel and that's the way I kind of started communicating with everyone. Plus we developed a website and that was another place that we could get information out. So it was really at the beginning of getting organized, it was a tremendous amount of um, just grunt work, leg work, emails, and just getting the necessary, you know, it was a lot of coaching and cheerleading and supporting too, because when push came to shove, a lot of plaintiffs jumped off because they got scared. So you had to really believe in what you were doing to stick with it. Yeah. So, so they were holding people's jobs over their heads and bu- kind of bullying them into compliance. <clears throat> and then you were like the first frog to jump out of the pot and say, I'm not going to boil in here. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, that's a good analogy. <laughs> well, it's scary. You know, nurses, nurses by nature, we're not confrontational. We're more peacemakers and mm-hmm. we're, we're 
we're advocates. That's our nature. That's our role. And um, it's it's it, nurses as a whole um, don't have well defined boundaries, and so they are um, easily taken advantage of. But it's also what makes them, uh, I say, them us good at nursing because we we are empathetic and we are compassionate and we do want to extend ourselves you know we want to extend ourselves to others but that's a fine balance and yes. and over the years i've seen for myself how that's taken advantage of yes and uh, because they just keep kind of pushing the line further and further to see how much people will accept and you know lately it's not just been pushing the line it's been pushing people over the line Oh, yeah. I mean, all of my career, there's always been a nursing shortage. That right there tells you something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So <laughs> there's then, a problem. So when you started your Zoom meeting and you re realized that you had a critical mass and that you had to jump into action and start doing the grunt work and you had some help, but it must have, it must have been pretty affirming to have that much interest and support from like-minded people and, and then must have been very helpful for them to understand that they were not alone because that's a big problem is that people feel like they're alone or they're there's nobody else who thinks like they do or feels like they do when they're getting run over by by whoever it might be oh certainly that first zoom meeting about 30 minutes into it i found myself getting very angry um, I could feel my blood pressure rising because I knew there was a tremendous need out there. I underestimated how desperate they were for someone, something to rally the troops, to, to, to be of support, to provide some potential answers, action, anything. I mean, they just wanted an alternative. Um, and it was very affirming, correct? I mean, you're right about that. It was exciting too. You know, it was, um, uh, I was very passionate about what I was doing and thank God because it took a tremendous amount of energy to keep it going. I, I'd say for f probably four to five weeks, um, you know, I don't know how many hours a week we worked. I had a right-hand gal that I recruited. She worked weekends. And so she was available during the week, Monday through Friday, to help me. And she was equally as committed and uh, passionate as I was about about fighting this fight. And we'd spend, you know, 50, 60 hours a week, um, pretty much seven days a week for several weeks, uh, getting it all together, working with the attorney's office. It, it, it took a lot of man hours to just pull it all together, basically. Yes. And, and yeah. Yeah, so really just putting everything you had into it and then starting to get traction and success over time, gathering people to the cause. What well, something that kind of strikes me is that, you know, I'm sure as a nurse that you have advocated for your patients since day one. And part of that is like advocating is informed consent, doing no harm and voluntary services. And then when the when the employer turns around and says, well, this is involuntary and there will no be, will be no informed consent for nurses, they will just have to comply. It must have been just turning of the world upside down for everyone. Yeah, I mean, the whole informed consent process has been certainly a topic of discussion, um, you know, and when I was teaching, leadership was one of the courses that I taught aside from being in the hospital and teaching the graduating seniors. And part of the leadership is teaching nursing ethics, which involves patient advocacy and involves what informed consent looks like. And, um, you know, to a certain extent, certainly there's, uh, I've seen the, the, the documentation that the um, healthcare workers read before they, you know, decide to take the shot. The problem is, unless you have, um, I mean, if there's no long-term data there, 
it's it's partially informed. It's not really fully informed. And the other thing is, if someone is is feeling coerced into making a decision, that component cannot be a part of the informed consent process. Right. So certainly somebody feeling like they're going to lose their job or knowing they're going to lose their job if they don't take the shot, how can that be fully informed consent? That's not, you know, it's not voluntary. No, no. At all. So you're right. There were some very important elements in the informed consent process that has kind of, you know, just been thrown to the wayside as far as I'm concerned. Um, so certainly medical ethics has just been shoved to the side of the road. Um, and, and there's no, no way around that. I mean, you can't, you can't argue that we have stuck, stuck to our, our code of ethics. So how about like liability? So if, if you get injured or have an adverse reaction from a shot, like who has the liability for that? If the, even if they coerce you into it. Well, um, my understanding is that the vaccine industry in general has no liability ever since uh, Ronald Reagan signed something, I think in either 1986 or 87 that released, um, big form from liability when it comes to vaccines. But as far as an employer, my understanding is if you're an employer mandates you, um, take a vaccine and you have an adverse event, the employer can be held liable. Mm -hmm. um, what some of the hospital systems did is they had the employee signed a release of liability mm -hmm. before they took the shot. That right there <laughs> tells you they didn't have full confidence in the therapeutic they were offering. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, I personally would have never signed that. And, you know, I don't, I'm sure there were other healthcare workers that either didn't sign it or better yet, probably didn't take it, but at that, you know, so the choice was kind of like here, um, take these shots or lose your employment. And, and if you take the shots, then you're signing away any liability. You're taking on the full brunt of any liability for injuries. It doesn't sound like a very good choice either way. No, yeah. no, it's, uh, yeah, it, all of it stunk pretty good. Mm. <laughs> so what was the basis of the case that you all brought and how many plaintiffs were there? And maybe could you tell us a little bit about the case? Sure. Um, so our lead attorney, um, he was very clear in that the case needed to be a legal case, not about the vaccine, because the vaccine has been a moving target. You know, how can you argue benefits versus risks when we have no long term data? I mean, that would be hard to prove in a in a court. Um, as time passes, we'll have more information and, and, and more tangible data that those types of things will be able to be proven. But early on, that's a hard case to sell and to win. Um, so it's really about our rights. I mean, if you think about it, it's not so much about the shot as it is about the rights that they're taking from you. And so that's what the case is about. Here in Louisiana, um, our state constitution clearly states that we have a right to determine what we put into our bodies. And it's called an affirmative right, okay? Um, the employers here in Louisiana, it's an at-will state, meaning they can terminate someone for pretty much anything as long as it's not, it's not on a basis of discrimination, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, religious, right. educational, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, so our argument is that, well, if you have an affirmative right, that should trump an employer mandating something as an as a requirement for employment especially if it involves injecting something into your body something that is still under 
um, emergency use authorization, something that is really, a, uh, I know they say it's not a new technology, but it is in the way it's currently being used. I know mRNA, they've been messing with mRNA technology for a while now, but they haven't injected masses of people with it. That's that's never been done. So um, a lot of reasons to be cautious as far as I'm concerned. And, and so that's what so, our case has been. I mean, let's say that it wasn't experimental. It was, it was apple juice. Should, should your employer be able to require you to inject apple juice into your bloodstream or, you know, <laughs> a, any other substance for that matter? I, I personally think not. Um, you know, their argument is, well, you have to have all these immunizations, you know, for employment to work certain places. It's, it's just another immunization. I don't think that that holds any water because it's not just another immunization. And honestly, mo there are immunizations that most of the time you can sign waivers on most of these. If there's a reason, a valid reason yes. that you feel like um, you can't take it, you don't want to take it, whatever, whether it's medical or religious. And that's the other thing here in Louisiana, we have a strong um, um, protection for our religious beliefs. Mm -hmm. So uh, the holy religious exemptions, we, we've had a couple of hospital systems here who didn't even, um, they, they weren't even granting the religious exemptions. There's a case going on with a, a hospital system in North Louisiana right now where they terminated several employees and didn't even, uh, didn't even honor religious exemptions. So the, the two hospital systems involved in our lawsuit um, they did have exemptions. Now, once, once the case broke one of the systems, they granted almost all the religious exemptions. Mm -hmm. I think it made a difference. Yes. yes. <laughs> the other one granted all the exemptions for the plaintiffs, but not necessarily everyone else. Wow. <laughs> I, I can't prove that they didn't grant the others, yes. but I know that some people have with the other system, some people have been terminated as a result of of not taking the shot. Yes, and you know, some people refer to that as experimental gene therapy, and that it's not actually a vaccine in the true sense of the word. So they they have changed the definition of what a vaccine is over time to try to accommodate that. And it might be that it's also helpful to shield them from liability by calling it a vaccine and having it under that 1986 law that shields the manufacturer. Um, so with, with your case, like how did it progress and where is it now? So the local courts initially, the district courts, um, more or less it was heard in four courts, two in South Louisiana and two in North Louisiana, and um, pretty much got dismissed on no cause. One court here in Lafayette, Louisiana said, you have a case, uh, but it's premature meaning um, as soon as someone is terminated over this, bring it back to, our, to my court and I'll hear it. Mm -hmm. Well, at least that judge ruled that way. We still feel like, no, I mean, we have standing. Um, but again, it's a very political situation. <laughs> a lot of attorneys don't want to touch it. So I know the judges don't want to touch it. Um, that's not saying. I, I'm just saying that's a factor out there that you can't help but worry about. Um, I'm not, I'm sure the judges are doing their best to, to hear the case and be as objective as they can. Um, but I can promise you, no one wanted these cases. I don't know a single justice that wanted to sit there and, and hear this because it's, it's, it's not a popular case to rule on. So we appealed and it got to the appellate courts and um, the appellate court down for in the in southern area. Basically, I don't think they did much with it. I think they ruled on the side of no standing. But the appellate court in the northern part of the state said, uh, no, they have standing. You, you you need to hear this case. And they threw it back to the, uh, the local courts um, before that could happen. The state Supreme Court took it and said, we're going to hear it. 
And so a little over a week ago, well, it's about 11 days now, 12 days ago, um, December 7th, I think it was, it went to the uh, state Supreme Court and the seven justices heard the oral arguments from our attorney and from the opposing attorney. Mm -hmm. And um, at the end of the oral arguments, they gave the attorneys an extra 10 days and um, to add 10 pages to their argument. Um, So that was on the 17th. So now we're kind of in the waiting. We're waiting to hear a decision. I don't think we'll hear anything before Christmas. Our attorney feels like it probably won't be till after the new year, but we'll see. And and really the state Supreme Court is just going to determine whether we have standing. If we do, they throw it back in the local courts and they have to hear it. Mm. But then we get we get to full disclosure of everything going on. And the longer this goes on, the stronger our case is, I feel, because there's so much coming to light. And there's so many other cases now. I mean, we were one of the early cases as far as for a state lodging, I say a state, anybody, any group of healthcare workers lodging a, a lawsuit against their employers. Now there's several out there and there's some 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 precedent, some decisions out there that are kind of turning the tide. Yes. And, and so how unusual was it for the Supreme Court to pick up the case before it got through the lower court system? Very unusual. Um, I've talked to a couple of attorneys and they said they've never heard that happen before in the state and they've been practicing their whole lives. So it was um, somewhat unprecedented. I know that's a ugly word these days, but it seems to fit every, every other sentence. (laughs) And when we had talked earlier, you mentioned your attorney's kind of closing arguments when he had his two minutes left. What, what did he say to the justices? Oh, I'm not going to do him justice because he did so <laughs> well. <laughs> he, uh, let's see. He pretty much, he said, so um, what the, the argument, you know, the opposing attorney's argument is that, um, how do you say it? As a citizen of Louisiana, you have an affirmative right to determine what goes into your body. Unless your employer tells you differently, you know, (laughs) unless your employer deems it a requirement for employment, then you don't have that affirmative right, (laughs) Right. you know. So that's the that's the crux of it. You know, that's really the crux of it. And and our position is you either have an affirmative right or you don't. Mm -hmm. Okay, if we don't have an affirmative right, then, yes, the employer can do what they want. But if we do have an affirmative right. Meaning our position is that the justices, it's the court system to protect that affirmative right. We don't have to prove anything. It's our right to begin with. They should rule to protect it. We shouldn't have to prove that we have the right because it is stated. It is stated in our state constitution. Right. It's like saying, I have the right to be free. That's a sovereign right. You know, I mean. I don't know. It doesn't seem that complicated, but I guess it is. It doesn't seem that complicated, but I, it's definitely political and there are a lot of complications for sure. So one, so if you receive standing, if the case gets standing, it goes back to the lower courts, then you have the right to discovery, right? Mm-hmm. We get to bring in expert witnesses, you know, um, so you can witnesses. do data requests and email yeah. requests and yeah. All sorts of stuff. Yeah, yeah so. documents, um, um, communication that the hospital has, um, you know, um, communicated to with the employees and just a variety of things. Um, I think it makes a difference because oh. because then you can really look at the details of how crazy it's all been. Yes. <laughs> and how is the cash flowing? That's the other question. Oh. <laughs> well, look, had somebody say, "Well, make it, if, <laughs> yeah, if you if you want to become a um, what I don't know, a, a, a not for profit, yeah, <laughs> a not for profit uh, guru, yeah, we we've had to raise a lot of money for legal fees. Is that what you're talking about? No, I'm talking about the cash flow for uh, 
per vaccine or per person oh, getting shots. Flow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's 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 a much higher cash flow for sure. Yeah, it's about it's about money, but more importantly, I think it's more about control. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. how can people help Louisiana for medical freedom, and then what can they do on their own turf? How can they resist? Well, you know. Um, let me start with the second question first. My message to everybody is that uh, you don't have to be somebody to do something. And when I say somebody, you don't have to have a big title. Um, you just have to have the conviction to want to act and go with it. Um, you know, take the first step. I had no clue I'd be a part of a lawsuit when I resigned from my job. That was the furthest thing from my mind. I just I just knew that we needed to do something. But when I really sat down and looked at it, there's only two things that that healthcare systems and big business understands. Money, legal action. Nothing else really matters. That's you it. can sit down and have all the conversations in the world. That doesn't matter. It won't change anything. They'll they say it'll change things, but it doesn't. It's about are they making money? Are they losing money? And uh, do they have to worry about being sued? <laughs> and and so, especially when, you, when you're dealing with large hospital systems, um, so you don't have to really have a finely tuned plan. You just have to um, feel the spirit. <laughs> you know, feel it moving in you. If it's moving in you, trust that God's going to open doors. And all you got to do is walk through because then he'll just keep opening doors. And um, I never dreamed in a million years that, you know, it's only what, four months later and we have a suit that went to the state Supreme Court. I, I'd have, you'd have told me this a year ago, I'd have just laughed and laughed. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing is just become involved, you know, um, and then. To answer the first question, how can you help Louisiana for Medical Freedom? Pray for us, because this has been uh, this has been a spiritual battle. It's been a, a spiritual mission, and I think it's important that we all stay uh, positive. We keep praying, um, seeking justice, not complying when we know it makes no sense to comply. Uh, you know, a beautiful example of of uh, I think it's a, a hospital in Houston a couple of months ago, a large group of doctors and nurses got together. I want to say it was like 160 something. And they went to, I don't know, the hospital administration, the board, whatever. And they said, you pass this mandate, we're walking. And they meant it. And um, they reversed the, the, the requirement. They said, okay, we're not going to do it. They kept their, their employees. The employees kept their jobs. And I'm hoping everybody's living happily ever after. But unfortunately, if everybody would band together on the front end and, and just make and just say, look, this is not right and we're not doing it. That's where the power really lies. But unfortunately, we're we're pretty far down in the process. And a lot of people have at least taken the first round of, of, of the shot. But that doesn't mean you have to take the booster. You don't have to keep taking the booster. I mean, you can. You can all stand together at this time and that could make a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that, so, it, it's not going to end right. The requirements and the, and the declaration of fully vaccinated is going to keep moving. That goalpost is going to keep moving and try yes. to herd people into a system of control around passports and really moving towards a medical social credit system is highly discriminatory and offensive and uh, certainly enough to get angry about once you understand what's going on. And really, I think it's a righteous anger and stepping out there and just saying no and recognizing that you're not alone is a, is a real big deal. And yeah, praying for the people who are losing their jobs and standing up and saying no and the effort that 
you all are taking and other people across the country, it's really, uh, really touching a lot of people. You know, I'm hearing from my network that the case in Louisiana has helped them out and it's kind of put the brakes on other places in the country. And I'm wondering, it seems like it's continuing to kind of flip flop at the federal level. And Mm -hmm. I don't really know what that means for state regulation or state law. And it seems like people are very confused now and the, the corporations are confused and it's really a mixed bag. Um, you know, one, one thing that kind of comes to mind is what can we do to form a parallel service economy that is not dependent upon big pharma or government for to sustain itself. And maybe it's more of a local or a one-to-one or a word of mouth type set of businesses. And I, I don't know, uh, how your connections are doing, losing their jobs, or are they finding other jobs, or are they finding other opportunities? Um, or are, they, are they in despair? Do they need support? What else can, can we do? Well, the people that, you know, people find a way. Um, unfortunately, some, pop, some people probably went and, and, and took the shot so they can keep their job. Mm-hmm. Um, some people got other jobs. They, they found places they can work where the mandate wasn't um, enforced yet, mostly outside of the hospital setting, or they went to a hospital that was liberal with the exemptions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so they moved around. Uh, the ones who were terminated, they kind of had a plan B because they were so convicted, like one, one nurse, uh, she's homeschooling her kids. And um, I, I don't really know exactly what her plan B is, but, but she's very resolved in how she, they, you know, people are angry now. Uh, even if they were to take away the mandate, the way they, some people have been treated, they don't want to go back to their former employer. Right. They're so disillusioned with the healthcare system. <laughs> I, I think, I think you make a very um, valuable suggestion when you talk about a, a parallel society. And I don't think we have to necessarily call it a parallel society, although that's one way to reference it. Mm-hmm. I'd like to think of it as another option. Yes. You know, so if if we start other options that are more appealing, that's that's how you dismantle the other option. You know, the option you don't like, you provide something that you like. And then you start attracting like-minded people. And if it's successful and it's truly um, a place that thrives where people feel free (laughs) and they feel productive and they feel like they're making a difference and they don't they don't feel controlled. And that's just going to snowball into success. Yes. And that's the success over here is 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 going to pull business from this entity over here that they're not going to be the monopoly anymore. And that's what needs to happen. Yes. Some free competition. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Some real focus on health, the real health care system. Yes. Because the conventional system is a sick care system. It's something. Let's be real. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I. I really appreciate you <laughs> coming on with me to have this discussion. Um, um, I'm just yeah. have a heartfelt support for you and your organization. And I, it's very nice getting to know you. And I hope that you'll have success with the court case and things will move in the right direction. And I know regardless of whatever happens, you'll be out there fighting. So that makes me feel good. <laughs> <laughs> well, um- I appreciate um, you taking the time just to learn more about what we've, you know, been doing, and it and it makes mm-hmm. me it makes me feel good to know that what's happening in Louisiana is making a difference in other states and potentially in the nation. Um, because that's at the end of the day, we're all Americans, and 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 we all uh, want to be from the land of the free, you know, and life, right. liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Yes. Um, 
it's really that basic. So we're all in it together. And um, don't be afraid to proclaim that. Don't be afraid to protect that. Um, you know, the other thing we did, I think that also made a difference for our community. And I, 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 I failed to mention it is we had a lot of rallies. We got in the street with signs and um, medical freedom signs, uh, usually three hours at a time. Uh, on the corner of, of busy traffic sections. And uh, in the beginning, you know, news cameras came out every time, but we had so many rallies that they stopped coming after a while. <laughs> but we we had so many honks. <laughs> we, we, we had this honkometer where we had a, <laughs> it would count the number of honks. Yeah. And uh, I want to say the highest the honkometer got was maybe 2,600 at one rally. Uh, we haven't had a rally recently, but the time change, it's tough because it gets dark at, you know, 5, 5.30. Yes. It's getting cold. And now with the holidays, people are distracted, you know, with getting ready for Christmas and stuff. But, yeah, who knows? Maybe we'll have some more rallies in, in January. But um, I, they, I think they served a purpose because it, it raised public awareness and it encouraged us because with all the honks and the and the people hanging out the window and oh, keep it going, you know, keep it up. Uh, we got a couple of uh, other reactions that weren't too kind, yep. but for for not many at all, <laughs> considering <laughs> certain fingers were shown to us, you know. <laughs> yep. We we had people pull up to the light. They had their mask on in the car by themselves. I mean, like, take the mask off, and they look. And probably, the little old man takes off his mask and smiles, and we all, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he smiled and he drove off. You know, yeah. that was like a victory. Yeah. People are scared. People don't, don't understand. Yeah. They really don't. No, they don't. No. <laughs> so there's lots of little things you can do, and just just talking to your friends and your family, and you know, try not to alienate relationships. But whenever you you can press the issue a little bit. Try to. Yep. Just if the door's open, then then put a foot in there. <laughs> <laughs> you might get your toe slammed. You Just might. keep that in mind. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Monique. Um, so we'll talk to you again again soon then. Thank you yeah, so much. Yeah, I'll uh I'll keep you up.